what populations are incarcerated, what is, um, how do we compare to other nations, and kind of the business of incarceration is to me what, what mass incarceration and the study of mass incarceration is really all about. You asked about who, um, what populations are incarcerated, so what do you see? Well, I mean, it's what exists, not just what I see. Uh, you can clearly see that we skew heavily toward people of color who are incarcerated and people who are poor and are incarcerated. So I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, well, why is this? I mean, I'm a big believer in asking questions about what we see. And so we know that, you know, justice is not exactly equal for people of color in this country, unfortunately. And there's a real correlation, uh, of, you know, and we'll hear stories today of people who serve time, um, partly because of the way the justice system was set up for them. If you are white and middle class, the chances of you being incarcerated on a similar charge as someone who's poor and African American uh, is, is, is much less, much less likely if you're, you have some kind of uh, financial resources. So when I give my talk tonight, I'll talk a little bit about some of the statistics. Um, it's been interesting to see, you know, and it's certainly if you're talking about mass incarceration for women, uh, you, we know that most women who are in prison have, have been sexually assaulted in some capacity. Um, you know, I think we often know that as a detail, but we don't dig into the fact of that. Like, well, what does that mean, and how do you help people, and, and what do you do with that information, and why are all these people who are in prison, you know, sexually assaulted? Like, maybe we should think about what that's telling us as a fact. I think we don't necessarily dig into all these numbers and statistics that we know about incarceration in America. What impact do we see on people um, who are not incarcerated? but oh related God. to someone who they, they are incarcerated in a way, right? If you have a family member who's incarcerated and if they're not a close drive or if there's not a bus to get there, then you might either spend all your time trying to get there and lots of money trying to go see somebody and keep them in your life if you have children and you want them to know their, their mom or their dad. Or you might not have a chance to visit at all if you can't afford it. Um, you know, I've been working on a documentary about women who get to bring their babies with them behind bars, raise their children in prison with them for the first three years of their lives. You know, the idea is, well, maybe some of these women will be encouraged to um, turn their lives around if they, if they have a child that they've bonded with. Um, you know, it's a, it's a bit of an experiment, but I think the goal is to make sure you don't have yet another baby who doesn't know his or her mom because the mother's gone off to prison and this infant, you know, is sort of sent off to foster care or sent to live with a grandparent. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of its own incarceration, I think, for family members um, who are really just, you know, trying to deal with the loss of that family member who's behind bars. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, you mentioned money um, and. What kind of economic impact do we see of mass incarceration oh, on a broader scale? Oh, it's massive. I mean, on a couple of different levels, right? It's a big money maker. Obviously, there's you know, towns where the entire business is running a prison, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and also, it's a big money loser in communities where a big portion of the population has gone off to prison, and then it becomes, of course, virtually impossible to get a job. So you remove people from the economic picture. It's a great story, and I'll reference it tonight about, I think it's in New York City, about um, what they call million dollar blocks. Have you read that? I should share this article with you. So in million dollar blocks are the number of blocks in the city where they, they're spending a million dollars to incarcerate people. I mean, imagine that a million dollars, which is being spent every year mm -hmm. on, on people who are incarcerated who live on that block. If that money were actually just put into that block, I mean, uh, imagine what that block could, could look like, could be the potential. So I think it's something that um, we have to really consider because it's, it's obviously a, a big money maker and also a, a big money waster. Last year, last summer, you uh, challenged the media about using the term thug <laughs> and how um, it kind of creates a perception as the exactly. gatekeepers. So do you see a connection between that criminalization of certain populations yeah. I mean, and incarceration? Absolutely. Can you talk about I mean, I think it's really important, a very important part of criminalization is to make people feel like that person is worthless, they're a monster, right? So you feel good that they are gone away. You have to feel like that incarceration is just, that there can't be any questions, that it was, you know, 
wrong in any capacity. The reason you call people thug is to dehumanize them. The reason you call someone a monster is to dehumanize them. It makes us feel better about them not being treated like humans if they're already dehumanized. And we do that all the time, even for people who are not being incarcerated. We do it especially for people of color, and we do it for people who are in poverty a lot. I did a doc, my second Black in America doc. I was um, doing a story on a young woman who was 18 and going off to college. Um, it was a story on a guy who runs a high school called um, Capital Prep Magnet, Magnet School, and um, his name is Dr. Steve Perry. And this young woman's name was Glorious Menifee. And the script that came back from my producer said, the producer does the first kind of first draft. Glorious Menifee's mother is a crack addict and her father is an alcoholic. Those things are true, but who describes someone as a sum total of their parents' dysfunction? I mean, it's these shorthands that we use in TV news. She grew up in the ghetto. You know, her mom's a crack addict. Like, you know, you know what the story's about, wink, wink, wink. And if, if Glorious had, in fact, not been a black woman in poverty, but she had been a white suburban kid, the story would have been, little Jimmy Jones is 12 years old. He loves baseball, and every day he goes out to the backyard and practices throwing the ball because he wants to be Derek Jeter when he grows up. Every night he saves up money to buy a mitt, blah, 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 right? Because that's how we tell stories of people who are middle class. We would never make him the sum total of his parents' dysfunction. It's how you humanize someone, right? You tell the story of them, or you dehumanize someone. And so certainly for populations in prison, we dehumanize them all the time. It makes us feel better about the decisions we're making. It also makes us not have to think about what's happening behind those bars and what the responsibility is and the accountability is for the people who are managing those folks about what's going to happen while they're in there and what, ha what do they come out to. Can that story be untold? Can, can that story, um, the way that people are branded, untold? can it be undone? Or? Oh, of course. Yeah, you get branded as a jerk, you know? You, you open your mouth and you complain and you refuse to read it and you say no and you rewrite it. Oh yeah, do you pay the price for it? Sure, you do. But that's okay, that's not a very high price. Absolutely, if you're gonna be a journalist, that's what you're gonna do. Not everybody's gonna love you. That's okay. Thank you. You're most welcome. Pleasure to chat with you.